morning, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. I feel a little funny following up on Russell's keynote because he said so many nice things about what we've been doing in the Asperis project, and now I have to like actually live up to that. So uh, if you bear with me, we'll kind of go through a little bit of what we've been doing in the past year um, and how that sort of fits into a slightly larger context of where our, we think the project is going. Uh, and we'll actually go into this depth on several of the features that have been added over the past year. So I actually showed this slide at AstroDevCon uh, on, that was Monday, right? It's been a long week. Tuesday, it was Tuesday. Um, it's been a long week. I like this slide because I think it kind of provides a little bit of context into the releases that have been made in Asterisk and sort of just some very broad overall themes that have occurred within certain periods of time within the Asterisk project. Uh, you'll note that although the Asterisk project began in 1999, I don't have anything beyond before 2005. Uh, that's partially because the commit logs tend to turn into one-liners as Mark Spencer was just merged from FTP on every single commit as people fed, fed him commits. So it's a little bit harder to draw like broad conclusions about the commits that went in at that point in time. Uh, but starting with about sort of Asterisk 1.2 and through the Asterisk 1.4 time frame, the Asterisk project was very heavily focused on what I would call adding a lot of the PBX features that we all take for granted today. This is where a lot of the functionality in the dial plan in dial plan functions and a lot of the original APIs in Asterisk were first developed and really built out Asterisk as that Swiss army knife of communications. Lots of very active contribution and very uh, large numbers of end user features that occurred during this uh, period of time. Starting around Asterisk 1.6, the project at that time began to experience probably a little bit of growing pains with some of the architecture decisions that had been made inside Asterisk. And so the project began to do a lot of work internally on frameworks and API improvements inside of Asterisk to improve stability, to improve reliability of the project. And that really kind of began to bear out really with Asterisk 1.8 in sort of this later time frame where we began to move a lot of these PBX features over onto these frameworks. Hopefully, nobody ever noticed other than, you know, hey, this bug I had just disappeared. That's, that's really what we were going for uh, with a lot of that. At the same time, we continue to extend and enhance Asterisk as that communication Swiss Army knife, providing a lot more features for PBXs, for call centers, for all of these uh, very well-defined communication use cases. Now, at about 2000, when, when was Asterisk 12? Uh, so really at DevCon in 2012, at, uh, when we had just finished releasing Asterisk 11, which was the last long-term support release that we made, the developer community got together and we asked ourselves some hard questions about what should Asterisk be growing as? How should it be going? Um, what are some of the really hard fundamental architectural issues in Asterisk that we would like to go solve? And Asterisk 12 was the first release where we re-architected a whole large chunk of the underpinnings inside of Asterisk to provide for better APIs, to provide for better functionality. I'm very excited about Asterisk 13 because it's the first long-term support release built on this new architecture. So quick show of hands, who all knows what happened in Asterisk 12, what all we did? A few people. Nobody really wants to, that's kind of like some tentative, like don't ask me any questions about it though, right? You know. I didn't know he was going to ask things. I just came to hear him. I, don't, I, I didn't want to participate. Um, all right, so another que quick question. Who knows the difference between standard and long-term support releases? All right, that, that makes me feel really good because um, admittedly, the Asterisk project has a long and torturous history of changing version numbers and release strategies and all sorts of things. Over the past couple of years, I think we've really landed on this model and it seems to be working pretty well. So. I'm not going to announce at three o'clock today that we're going to change the version number scheme again. We're gonna, we're gonna keep going with this. <laughs> um, and by the way, I had to write a library that parses asterisk version numbers and it's, it's very hard. Um, so asterisk 12 was a standard release, which means the focus of development in asterisk 12 was on architectural and large scale changes in the project to facilitate bigger things in the future, right? As a result, Standard releases have a one-year bug fix, one-year security fix, maintenance time frame, right? So for the past year, uh, we have been doing lots of bug fixes in Asterisk 12 in order to prepare ourselves for Asterisk 13. We've also been, uh, we changed the release policy slightly for Asterisk 12 as well, and we actually allowed 
new features and improvements to be made in Asterisk 12 if they were germane to the two focuses in Asterisk 12, which were better APIs and the new SIP stack. That really enabled a lot of great feedback from the community, both in terms of testing and allowing the community to begin building their next generation platform on top of the new architecture. A uh, good case study for this is the FreePBX guys. Uh, they, FreePBX 12 actually uses Asterisk 12 and they actually also have the ability to use the new SIP stack in that. They were instrumental in giving us lots of great feedback into the project as we were developing this about things they needed, think capabilities that needed to be added, and all this stuff got rolled into Asterisk 12 in time for the LTS, in time for Asterisk 13. So, since everybody was a little tentative on what actually went on in Asterisk 12, and because so much of Asterisk 13 is built on Asterisk 12, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what went on here and just kind of highlight some of this. So, we wanted in Asterisk 12 to provide better APIs uh, and provide a new SIP stack. Uh, the first one because we felt like Asterisk needed to uh, evolve from being the standalone PBX or the standalone call center that you drop in with a couple little widgets that you configure in your comp files to control the functionality to being able to be a engine of media and for your application, right? So that I can take Asterisk, put calls into it, and I can control all of the business logic for how these calls flow, how things behave together, when things happen, so I can build my own custom communications applications using Asterisk as that engine, okay? We needed better APIs, we felt, than what we had today in order to really get that done, to get to that point. Uh, the new SIP stack was based really on largely two factors. The first was that Chan SIP, um, to Mark Spencer's credit, so RFC 3261, which is the RFC for SIP, um, if I recall correctly, came out in June 2002, um, and Mark merged Chan SIP at the end of June 2002. So within a month, you know, the RFC comes out, Mark writes the channel driver, and we're off and running, right? Um, and not surprising, over the past 10 years, there were certain architectural design decisions that were made, or not made, that have limited the growth and capabilities of what we can add to that channel driver. It is, um, I think, in trunk, 38,000 lines of code in a single file, um, and that, as you might imagine, resists change uh, without breaking people. So what we wanted to provide was a much more modular SIP stack. Uh, in Asterisk 12 that we could then go ahead and enhance and extend in a very safe fashion so that we could add new SIP capabilities as people need them. So Asterisk 13, we wanted to focus on those same sorts of things but also focus on the end user features. Make sure that people can actually run the right CLI commands, get the information, provide good logging, all of the kinds of things that people need in order to actually go use this stuff in a production system. Um, as well, we also wanted to enhance some of the things that we had done in Asterisk 12. So, and I kind of already went through most of this. Um, the new SIP stack is based on Telu's PJ SIP. Uh, how many people have heard of the PJ project or the PJ SIP project? Great, that's fantastic. Um, it's a great SIP stack. I mean, this is a very well-proven SIP stack used in a whole lot of different applications, um, and we're able to leverage that, that uh, large community of testing in the Asterisk project as well. And let's face it, that's the power of open source, right? It's not just Digium or the Asterisk project relying on our expertise to produce a great SIP stack, we're able to leverage the expertise of everybody using PJ project to have a really awesome SIP stack. So that's great. Um, one of the, when I say SIP stack, that's because we didn't just write a channel driver. There is a channel driver. It's a very small piece of code, actually. The, the Chan PJ SIP is maybe between two and 3,000 lines of code total. Um, most of the functionality is spread out into a very highly modular stack that you can actually customize and load and remove modules if you don't need them. I think we're up to about 16 or 20 different modules that make up the overall SIP stack in Asterisk 13. Um, so for example, if I don't need a registrar, right, maybe um, I'm letting Kama Elio be my registrar and I just want to have Asterisk have invite requests pumped right to it, I can actually unload the registration functionality. I can unload ResPJ SIP registrar because I don't need it. And so I can make my SIP stack uh, more streamlined for my implementation. The big one, though, that we wanted to do with APIs uh, in Asterisk 12 was to fix, was to do two things. Um, so, show of hands in the audience again, because I like audience participation, as you can probably tell. Uh, how many people have built an application on top of Asterisk using AMI? Great. How many of you have ever seen a zombie channel? Okay, those are gone in Asterisk 12. <laughs> okay, so channels no longer get renamed. You have a stable handle to a channel 
at all times. They, we don't rename the channels. There is a predictable model for all of the events. So a channel is created with a new channel event. A hangup event signifies the destruction of a channel. When a channel enters a bridge, you get a bridge enter event. When it leaves a bridge, you get a bridge leave event. And when they are in a bridge, you know that there is a path of communication from that channel to all other channels in that bridge. There's no spurious little bridge events that come up with link, unlink, link, unlink, link, unlink. Um, and if you have ever hit a DTMF key while you're in a bridge, you know what I've seen if you see those AMI events. Um, so we solved all of those problems in Asterisk 12. Uh, you have a very, very predictable, easy system to go consume because Asterisk now can actually tell you exactly what happens in any complicated call scenario. If you have a transfer, you have a very well predictable model of events that come that happen in any kind of transfer. Blind transfers, attendant transfers, blonde transfers, how they're initiated, all that kind of stuff. So that was great. That, that right alone, we were like, yes, we've hit that, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, although AMI is great, AMI is really cool at lots of things. Uh, it's great for call control. Uh, and AGI is really great for remote dial plan execution. It's kind of hard to build your own custom communications application because we don't expose through those interfaces all the building blocks that we use when we're writing C dial plan applications. So we wanted to provide another API that could do that. So that you could actually write the same kinds of things that we write when we're writing in C, but you can do it in any language of your choice. All right, so to facilitate this, we had to make some core changes. Um, the big one is the new bridging framework that is used in Asterisk. So all bridges in Asterisk are now being funneled through a very um, well-architected, well-designed, very flexible, modular-built bridging framework. Uh, by the way, this is what ConfBridge in Asterisk 10 is also based on. We just took that and leveraged it across the entire system. Uh, so we'd already been using it for a while. One of the really hallmarks of this is that it actually has something that we call smart bridging, which is that the, mix, the way media is mixed in a bridge is not fixed, okay? A bridge will choose the best way to mix media based on the conditions of the channels that happen to be in the bridge. So a great example, so Ben and I are in a bridge together. We both SIP channels, everything's cool, um, and because we both are not behind a NAT and we don't have any special features enabled, uh, the bridging framework chooses the ability to do a remote bridge and the media flows between our devices, right, and bypasses asterisk completely. Then let's say we decide to add Melissa to the bridge. And Melissa is also an RTP channel, but oh no, now we have three people on a bridge. Don't we need a conf bridge? No, you don't need a conference, right? We just add the channel to the bridge, and then the bridge goes, oh, well now I've got three participants, I need to mix all these people together, so it re-invites our media stream back into asterisk, takes Melissa's media stream, and we go into a soft mix, and we start mixing all the media streams together, and then it sends them all back out to the participants. And then, you know, maybe we talk for a while and I drop out, and so Ben and Melissa are talking. Um, and, but maybe Melissa had a DTMF hook on her channel that said, you know, I want to enable one-touch parking. And so Asterisk goes, well, you know, previously we were remote bridge, but I can't do that because Melissa wants one-touch parking, so I'm going to keep the media stream flowing through Asterisk, but I also don't need soft mix. That's a little too heavy. So I'll go to a more optimized two-party bridging system. And all this stuff just happens under the hood. Um, so that was pretty cool. The stasis message bus is an internal concept. You, I hope you actually very rarely ever see it because it really is something just internal to Asterisk. But that allowed us to decouple uh, the producers of information in Asterisk with the, with the uh, frameworks and APIs that want to consume it. It really, that let us build out better APIs. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this other than to say that this let us pull all of the CDR code and CEL code and AMI code out of the bridging core and put them into their own respective modules, which makes them much more maintainable. Um, which is really, really nice. As I already mentioned, we have a consistent model for channels and bridges. Um, you will never see a masquerade ever again if you're using AMI. Uh, they're, you, they, not that they never happen internally, they happen very rarely now, um, but if they do happen, you will never know because that's not your job. That's Asterisk's job to maintain and understand what it's doing with the channels. Um, the big thing that we were able to do is we were able to build a new interface called ARI. And you might have heard Russell mention that, probably heard a couple other talks about ARI. The goal of ARI, it's a new API, and that's to build your own communications application. It's not a replacement for AMI. It's not a replacement for AGI. It is about letting you build your own voicemail application. So in AGI, I might have a channel executing in a remote script, and I tell it to go execute voicemail, right? That's not what ARI is about. With AMI, I might have a channel be redirected uh, to a different dial plan context and extension and have it go execute vo voicemail. And that's not what ARI is about. ARI is about not actually running voicemail in the first place, and you get to make your own voicemail system, or build your own call queue, or build your own conferencing engine. 
It's about letting you build your own dial plan application in the language of your choice. All right, so all of that was actually asterisk 12. So I guess we'll start talking about asterisk 13. Um, the focus of development on asterisk 13 was really in terms of extending those two concepts. Um, making PJ SIP as feature complete as we can for the vast majority of deployments. Uh, further enhancing the existing APIs, um, in particular focusing more on ARI, um, as well as really just focusing on preparing Asterisk to be an LTS release, right? We made these big architectural changes, but we want to make sure that it's production ready, that people are ready to go and able to go deploy it. All right, so PJSIP features. So there's a lot of them, and I'm just going to highlight a few, all right? And these are some new ones that are new in 13, not even in 12. Um, but there's some kind of cool things that make Asterisk better deploy, be, make Asterisk more attractive in certain scenarios and be able to do some really cool stuff. So okay, so one of the ones we added was resource lists. Who knows what resource lists are in SIP land? Somebody's waving their hand and he's really excited about this. <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna show you why you want resource lists. I won't tell you how we did it or how it's all implemented, but I'll show you why this is actually really useful. So who here has phones or people who want to uh, subscribe their phones to the presence of everybody else in the company? All right, you're gonna like this one. Okay, so Alice, Bob, Charlie, and David, and we got a Astra server in the middle here. And so let's take that scenario. So Alice subscribes to Bob. So she sends a subscribe request. Then she subscribes to Charlie. That's another subscribe request. Then she subscribes to David. That's another subscribe request. And because everybody likes all the BLFs and the fancy phones and stuff, so Bob wants it. And so he subscribes to Alice. And then he subscribes to Charlie. And then he subscribes to David. And you can get the picture, right? So I'm not gonna show you Charlie and David. So let's say we actually have a call and let's say we actually had everybody subscribe to everybody else in the system. So Alice sends an invite request to Asterisk. Asterisk sends an invite request to David. David replies back with 200 okay and the 200 k goes back to Alice and hey, we've got a path of media and everything's hunky dory. And the device dates change, right? So Alice is on a call and David's on a call. And Asterisk goes, oh no, now I have to tell everybody. And so it starts sending out notify requests everywhere, right? So first I've got to notify uh, David, Charlie, and Bob that Alice is on the phone, and then I've got to notify Alice, Bob, and Charlie that David's on the phone. And for those of you who are aware of big O notation, this is an order n squared problem, right? If I have n phones, I have to send out n squared notify requests. Each phone has to send out n subscribe requests to build out all the subscriptions. Um, that's my ASCII Picard facepalm. Um, this will, um, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work on the network. It's a lot of work on the asterisk server to have to go broadcast all these things out, process all these requests, um, and it limits how many different present states you really can have on your phone. We can do better with resource lists. Let's say instead of having all of these people have to be individual, I can create basically a buddy list. And my buddy list may be everybody in the company. Okay, so I put everybody in the company in one list, if, or I can create custom lists, I can create multiple lists, I can have lists of lists. I can go really crazy with this. Um, and so everybody subscribes to Ala, everybody subscribes to the Astra server for the list. So instead of having each one of these people send out N minus one subscription requests, they all send out just one, right? And Astra builds out a subscription for everybody based on this buddy list. Then we do the same thing, Alice calls David, David answers, they both go busy. And depending upon your settings, there's a bunch of different ways this can work. But one of the ways this can work is that Asterisk goes, oh, hey, um, I've got a buddy list with everybody in the company in it. Um, I'm gonna wait just a very small amount of time to let all of this stuff get aggregated together, and then I'll just send out one notify to everybody with the status of the buddy list, right? And so everybody gets the notification for Alice and David are on the phone, Alice and David are on the phone, they can all trigger their BLFs, and it's one sending of the event to all the people who wanted to know about it. So that's pretty handy. Distributed state. So who knew that Asterisk can share device, straight, device state between multiple Astra servers? Excellent. Uh, who knows the two ways that it can be done? One person looking tentative, not entirely sure. Don't call on me though, right? Sorry, so it's CoralSync and XMPP. You can either use a Jabber server in order to actually share device state back and forth using XMPP, or you can use CoraSync and it's a binary protocol that goes across between the servers and heartbeats and all sorts of really nifty things. One of the downsides of those two approaches is that you have to install something else. I either have to have a Jabber server or I have to have CoraSync installed and I have to go configure CoraSync and then I've got to hook onto it and CoraSync's kind of interesting and 
Jabber servers can be very easy to set up, but again, now I have to set up another server or put it on my asterisk box. So um, now we can actually just publish device state and MWI directly through the SIP stack uh, between asterisk servers. And this is a very short sequence of slides, but I still think it's very cool. So uh, Alice subscribes to Bob, and Bob subscribes to Alice. However, Alice is on asterisk instance one, Bob's on asterisk instance two. Uh, and if we configure the asterisk servers to do it, then let's say Alice goes on the phone, and asterisk server one has been configured to send information about Alice to asterisk instance two, even though Alice isn't even on that server. And so it does a publish request over to asterisk instance two saying, hey, Alice is busy. And asterisk instance two goes, oh, Alice is busy. That's great. Uh, well, I, I don't know who she is, but Bob said she, he wanted to know about her. So I guess I'll go ahead and send a notify request to Bob that Alice is busy. And Bob's little blinky light starts flashing because Alice is busy, right? Even though Alice has nothing to do with Astro Server 2. And I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> Um, I will say this much, if you have ever set this up, it's really, really cool when it happens, right? Like you know, like these things have nothing to do with each other. Oh, but I can see it anyways. Um, it's a very exciting thing to go put together. All right, so that's some, that's some, some of the PJ SIP enhancements that went into Asterisk 13. Um, we also spent a lot of time uh, enhancing the Asterisk APIs. Um, so one of the ones, and hey, I've got a slide about security, so I belong in this track. One of the things we did is we added security events to AMI. Uh, and again, audience participation. Who knew there was a security fr event framework inside Asterisk that has a special logging mechanism that emits a security log uh, in Asterisk? Okay, so if you don't know about that, you guys really should go take a look at that. That's actually been in Asterisk for a while. That was introduced, I think, in Asterisk 10. Um, and if you ever you how many people use fail to ban and analyze their logs in order to, okay. The security log is awesome because it's actually a well-defined, very consistent format that you can tell fail to ban to go consume. Uh, and so it's a very nice way of doing this. This is sort of a way of saying I don't even really want to use fail to ban. I want to write my own monitoring service that looks at asterisk, looks at security events, and based on the things that I see, I go take the necessary actions to go harden my system. Right? So one way you can do this, for example, is that I can watch the security events with a AMI little, little AMI script. And if it sees three failed authentication attempts from an IP address, it updates IP tables and blocks them, right? Or five, or 10, or, and then after like five hours, maybe it unblocks them because you know, somebody forgot their uh, pin and they just kept on mashing the phone incorrectly, right? So you can come up with your own policies and control this stuff yourself and use AMI as a way of getting that information. Uh, it's a lot of stuff in here in an AMI security event. Uh, this is one taken from my laptop. But it does contain a lot of very interesting information that lets you make decisions about how you want to go deal with the fact that this was a challenge response that failed. So challenge response failed is uh, somebody uh, tried to do something to asterisk, asterisk sent back a 401, they sent back another thing and they didn't fail, the, the, they failed the 401 challenge. So they provided some invalid credentials, invalid password, something like that. Okay, so that was, that's one thing we did with asterisk APIs in AMI. We spent a lot more time, however, focusing on the Asterisk REST interface, because it is really cool what you can go build with it. Um, I would highly recommend taking a look at some of the other talks today if you haven't already heard much about ARI. There's some really awesome things you can do. Um, and I don't have a slide sort of as an intro to ARI here, so you, if you haven't seen it before, you might just have to bear with me a little bit. Um, one of the things that was added is actually the ability to externally control MWI. And this is really kind of what you need if you're gonna build your own voicemail system. What we're talking about here is that, you know, traditionally, app voicemail does a lot of things internally to send out notifications that, okay, everything that is a SIP channel or an EECS or whatever kind of channel you have, you have a new message waiting, which then gets translated into the particular protocol and sends out these things to the devices. But if I'm writing my own voicemail, I can't use that, right? I, I don't want app voicemail. There is no voicemail.conf. I'm building my own. So I need to have something that I can go punch to the system that says, hey, there's messages waiting. Go send out a blinky, go, go make the light blink, right? Um, at ARI being a RESTful interface, I can do that with a simple HTTP put. And so I have a mailboxes resource. I tell you mailbox 1000, there it has two old messages and one new message. Do those messages even exist? I don't know. Like, Asterisk doesn't care. It actually does not even look at the file system or anything like that. It just says, you told me these messages exist. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to send that out to the devices. 
you can do some very funny things with this, right? Uh, you can, um, because you are building your own voicemail system, you could actually make the lights flash uh, even if there are no messages or take it out if there are. You could give different priorities to messages. You can build your own logic around that. Um, it was interesting. I was doing some testing at, uh, at uh, SIPIT, which is a great SIP conference. If you, if, if you don't know what SIPIT is, it's, it's where a bunch of industry people get together and we all just try to break each other's stuff. And we were testing out MWI and I just had a little ARI script that they could call into an extension and then the light would start flashing. And then they could call into another extension and it would drop the count back down to zero. And they never actually had to leave a message at all. Who here using AMI has ever used user events? A few people, cool. So we added user events as well to ARI. And that's kind of a nice thing if you, what you're building out is like say a custom call queue and you really are building out your own system of notifications to know what happened while somebody was in the queue. You can use user events to tie into say an existing system that actually uses user events to build out the logging. This also lets you tie an ARI application into your existing AMI applications. So for example, I can do a post to ARI events and craft this user event. Uh, it's, the event is awesome event. Uh, it is for channel one, two, three, four, five, and I put some custom data in there of foo and bar with a nice little JSON blob. Uh, and out of AMI, what I get back is actually this. I get out of my AMI, hey, a user event happened from awesome event, and it was for PJ Sip Alice, and that's your unique ID, and by the way, you get foo and bar as well. Uh, that kind of lets you bridge the gap between the uh, applications you've already developed using AMI, as well as whatever you may choose to develop using ARI. How many people, and I, I like doing this because I, I, you know, it's kind of fun. How many people use message send or any of the text messaging capabilities in asterisk? One, two, hey, cool, a few people, all right. Um, oh, okay, so this is different. Um, so asterisk has out of call text message processing. Uh, this is essentially tied to the SIP channel drivers, so SIP, the Chan SIP and Chan PJ SIP as well as uh, res XMPP or res jabber. So it understands XMPP messages as well as SIP messages. When a text message or a SIP message request comes in or an XMPP message comes in, it takes that text message and funnels it off to the dial plan. There's a set of uh, dial plan applications and functions that you can use to extract that information. And then you can also send messages back out using message send. And this functionality has been in since asterisk 10. Uh, there are some upstream SIP providers, for example, that will let you send SIP message requests and they'll convert that into an SMS uh, on their upstream provider. So that's interesting. And so we added the ability for ARI to do that as well. But because ARI is outside of the dial plan, it's your external application that is controlling everything, uh, these text messages no longer hit the dial plan. They just go straight to your ARI application. Uh, when a message comes in, you get a JSON event that says, hey, there was a message that came in, text message that came in. Uh, when you want to send a message, you just do a RESTful call and it sends a message out to whatever endpoint you told it to go send to. So sending a message is, again, something like the top line right there where I have a PJ SIP endpoint Alice and I send her a message of hello there and I say, hey, it's from Asterisk. Um, if Alice sends me something back, I get this nice text message telling me where it came from, the actual body of the message, you know, Watson, come here, the classic SIP test message. Uh, and it, there can even be some custom data and some custom fields that get added uh, depending upon how that SIP message request or that XMPP message is formatted. Um, and I think this is kind of cool. You can build some interesting things with this. Uh, technically, you could even build a SIP slash XMPP gateway doing something like this. I actually, you know, and I don't have an example of this. I really wanted to put one together and I just ran out of time. But I think there's some even cooler things you can do with this. How many people have looked at SIPML5 or JSSIP for WebRTC? Okay, so both of those libraries have the ability to send SIP message requests. That's interesting because I can send a SIP message request from my client that has nothing to do with text messaging. It could just be information about what that client has been doing, and that can get fed directly into my ARI application. So I might know, for example, that the client has been up for 10 minutes staring at this thing and I get a message request that goes in and says, hey, this guy's been staring at this thing for 10 minutes. Maybe you should have an agent that calls them or pops them. Um, you could do some interesting things going the other direction where you can send messages directly to your WebRTC client to, I don't know, change the color, 
play howler monkeys, I don't know, do some funny things, right? But you can actually view this text messaging integration not just as sending text messages, but actually as defining your own application-specific signaling back and forth between your WebRTC clients and your ARI application. And the great thing about this is you can write both of them in JavaScript, which is pretty nice. So last but not least, uh, we have done a lot of testing. And this is not a feature, this is just sort of what happens when you go build an LTS release. Um, we have two different sources of testing in the Asterisk project. We write unit tests inside the Asterisk uh, source code itself, and there's a fair number of test modules that are only conditionally compiled, uh, depending upon how you configure Asterisk. We also have a very large suite of functional tests in the Asterisk test suite. Uh, over the past several years, there has been a heavy emphasis on adding a whole lot of tests, uh, both for new features as well as for any major changes that we make. Um, and then periodically we go back and we do some code coverage analysis and we go back and backfill things that don't have tests yet, right? I could probably spend an entire presentation on this and I really should at an Astrocon, but just to show you the effect of this, these are the unit tests in different versions of Asterisk. So that's 1.8 and 11 and then that's 12, that's 13. The reason why there was such an explosion in unit tests is because we did these architectural changes and we were testing everything as we went. None of the new APIs or architectures don't have test coverage, don't have tests that exercise them. In functional tests, you see the exact same sort of growth trend. Uh, 1.8, these are the tests that were around for 1.8, for 10, for 11, for 12, and as you can see, for 13, and I expect that to continue going. Uh, these execute nightly. Uh, we, on multiple build agents, we, um, and every time we add anything or fix any major bug, we are adding tests for that to make sure that there's coverage. Uh, and this is important because we did big things. We did really cool things. But that's not good if you can't go deploy it. And so one of the things that we've been really working hard over the past two years is to make sure that everything is well tested and ready for use. Okay, but there's lots of other great things. So. Um, lots of new CLI commands and AMI commands have been added. Um, lots of documentation. Uh, this is one of those things that um, I'll just mention briefly. Uh, the documentation in Asterisk um, will not let you, so if we had a new uh, configuration item to a module uh, in any of the new modules and we don't document it, that module can't load. Uh, we are actually forced to document everything now. Uh, that documentation also gets pulled out and auto-generated and put up on the Asterisk wiki. So there's comprehensive documentation for all of the new features, all of the modules, everything actually has to be written down. Um, that may be that we actually have to improve what we wrote, but that's a whole other problem. Lots of enhancements to the APIs beyond the ones I just went through, lots of cool additions to ARI. Um, we also focus in Asterisk 13 on improving the performance. Uh, there was a large effort done that was also helped out by a number of community members to go do some significant changes to really kind of tweak the performance in certain areas of Asterisk. Everything that's new, by the way, is on the Asterisk Wiki. Please go check it out. Um, and as always, uh, as much as I want everybody to be chomping at the bit and can't wait to go install Asterisk 13, please, please, please do read the upgrade notes. Um, you know, it is a major version of Asterisk. It is a big, it is a big change going from, say, a 1.8 or 11 system to 13 because so many really cool things were done. Um, but again, we've worked really hard to make sure that all of that stuff is very well documented, that you have a lot of help when you make that process and that change. And again, with all the cool things I've done, I think it's absolutely worthwhile to make that transition. Questions? Time for just a couple questions. How painful will the transition from 11 to 13 be in terms of dial plan changes, et cetera? Dial plan changes is minimal. Okay. Um, so do you use Chan Agent? Yeah. Okay, that's the one that's not minimal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is fairly minimal for dial plan changes. Um, clearly, with all of the improvements we made to the APIs, if, for example, you wrote something that listens over AMI and you've been watching for masquerade events, well, they don't happen anymore, right? So you know, depending upon what your system is, you have to go look and see what it is. Now again, there is actually a specification for AMI on the Asterisk Wiki with how things work and the events that you can expect. There's actually also, we wrote specifications for CDRs and CEL and their behavior in the new versions of Asterisk. Um, there's copious notes on upgrading on all the different things. Um, and if you, f if you have a question and you can't find it there, by all means, Please, please ask on the mailing lists, ask in IRC, and we will go update it. 
Um, we are really cognizant as a project that the only way we can continue to move and go forward is if everybody can actually get there with us, right? So um, please do let us know if we did miss anything. Chain agent, however, um, uh, it, it actually was removed, but there are some uh, dial plan applications that do the exact same thing okay. and do it in a much more, I would say, stable fashion than Chan Agent ever really could handle. I could do one more question. Any other questions? What happened to the old SIP driver? It's still there. Chan so um, Chan SIP is not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, um, and although as a developer, I can stand here and say that the architecture makes me cry slightly. Um, the great thing about ChanSIP is that it has over a decade of use and bug fixes and interoperability, and that's not for nothing. I mean, that ChanSIP has processed an absolutely unfathomable number of calls, and we don't take that lightly. So ChanSIP still is still an asterisk, still has the same functionality, still works great. There's actually been some improvements and enhancements still done on it. Um, you can run it and the PJ SIP stack in parallel. It is possible to actually load both. You actually you clearly have to bind on a different port, right? But there you can run dual stack, and excuse me, a number of people have. Um, I don't see ChanSIP uh, going anywhere anytime soon, but Certainly, the focus of us as developers and as a project is on the new SIP stack. <laughs> um, so, a couple of highlights of the new PJ SIP stack. Uh, it's actually multi threaded. It's, I think it is. Uh, so, I, when we went to SIP it, we tested with the new PJ SIP stack and it went very well. I'll put it that way. Um, the new PJ SIP stack has enough, all the features that I just showed for those enhancements, those are things that Chan SIP can't do. There are a number of enhancements in the, there are a number of features in the PJ SIP stack that the Chan SIP, uh, the Chan SIP channel driver can't do. Um, at the same time, the Chan PJ SIP stack also has a number of things that are just better about it intrinsically. Uh, it had, like I said, it's multi-threaded, which means that if you do, a, if a SIP request comes in and that causes a database lookup, that doesn't block any of your other SIP requests. Uh, that's one of those sort of historical things with Chan SIP that if you ended up hitting a database and that database was offline, then everything piled up at that point. Which deadlocks are you talking about in Chan SIP? Because as far as I know, there's no deadlocks in Chan SIP right now. Have there been deadlocks in Chan SIP? Sure, but we fix those. Um, in Chan PJ SIP, Chan PJ SIP just has a very fundamentally different threading model, so it is far less likely to run into certain pain points than Chan SIP had in the past. Um, it also has better support for DNS. Uh, it has some very interesting support for doing multiple registrations with devices. Um, it can, there's just, it's a, it's a SIP stack. It's a very well-known SIP stack that has a lot of really cool features and capabilities baked in right into it. So I would highly encourage everybody to go use it. Um, we do need feedback. Uh, what I will say is that a number of people have been using it with Asterisk 12 and been pushing that feedback in, and we do feel like it is uh, ready for production. All right, I know there are going to be a lot more questions, and uh, certainly I think Matt will be around the rest of this yep. week. Uh, the Asterisk dev team, of course, the mailing lists are a good source. But right now, thanks, Matt, very much. Thank you.